Hey guys, it's Alexander Williamson here with the Secret History of Living in Your Aquarium. Today we're going to talk about an awesome fish. We've talked about it before, but we've never done a species spotlight on it. And today we want to talk a little bit about the care, the maintenance, the upkeep, water parameters, how to breed this fish, uh, some special notes about this fish, and also a little bit about the history of who discovered this fish and cataloged it and what's happened since then, as well as something that I've never heard covered in any videos about the amazing reproductive cycle of this fish. These fish are true gender benders, and if you haven't gathered by the thumbnail yet, I'm talking about the pea puffer or Malabar dwarf puffer, uh, or, or just dwarf puffer as some people know it. But it's got a lot of different names, and there's another species it's often mistaken or even confused with. So let's try to figure out which one you have in your possession or you're thinking of getting, and uh, then we'll go from there. So let's take a look at the little fish now. All right, so we're going to start this video off with the lovely pea puffers, five of them, uh, in a bag so we can actually make them out. I picked these up today and they're really healthy, really good looking puffers. Uh, they're just juvenile, just uh, a little bit smaller than adult size and not fully colored yet. Uh, these are a really great fish and um, you know the interesting thing about these is that most people think that they have the the pea puffer or the Malabar puffer which is from uh, the western uh, Ghats range of India kinda in the Kerala region down in south I guess south central to south western India but these fish you're looking at here are all born female so these fish are all born female a little fact that a lot of people don't talk about and this happens in both the species that we're going to talk about in a sec here. But they're all born female, and then a male who has grown the fastest and is the strongest of the small shoal or group that he's hanging out in, oftentimes the same one that he hatched in, the male will start to develop out of the strongest and largest one. And sometimes a few can develop because they'll hang out in shoals of hundreds of fish sometimes in the wild, but what he does is he releases not just hormones uh, like testosterone into his own body, allowing for him to become more masculine, uh, more brightly colored, larger finage, and more aggressive and territorial, but he actually puts out blockers of, of testosterone and estrogen boosters for the other fish that surround him. So you'll get an alpha male in a group generally, and even if that group's 50 fish, you may get three or four males, but you'll get one alpha male. If they're in an area about two square meters, so we're talking out in the wild, uh, or very large fish tanks for a small fish like this, uh, you will get one male that is the dominant one. You may get some subdominant males, and then you'll get probably a large... Uh, amount of females. Now this can change if one of them dies or gets hurt or gets sick, uh, gets weak and old, another one will challenge it for that and if it can overcome that one, the, the alpha male, it will then become the new dominant male. So that's something that I just have never really heard discussed and there's new uh, papers, scientific papers just on this and of course on this channel we've talked a lot about scarlet battis and other Indian uh, subcontinent fish and many others that are able to manipulate gender during times of you know famine and other other hardships in their environment it's really amazing how quickly fish can adapt and change uh, when need be be it diet or gender or uh, color and you know behavior it's just amazing so when we're looking at pea puffers let's kind of let this bag float for a sec see what they do let's see if we can spin it around and just let them kind of hang out for a minute and then we're going to let them go and we're going to feed them too uh but 
when you're looking at these guys, uh, you're usually assuming that you have the Karen Otetrodon uh, Traven uh, Coricus, which is your standard pea puffer. However, there is another fish that is so similar that you cannot tell them apart until around six months to a year old uh, when they're fully developed. And you'll find the difference in that uh, there are black dots on the second species, which is the Carinotetraodon uh, imitate. <laughs> and the imitate or imitator is the actual species name of this other uh, pea puffer variety and it's found in the same area so it gets collected and it often comes into shops but it does not seem to uh, commingle or hybridize or crossbreed with these pea puffers the Malabar pea puffers so kind of interesting there but what you'll be looking for would be small black dots instead of these big uh, blotches of color and there's lots of teeny little black dots in between, which is also how you can kind of tell a female, whereas the male will have kind of lines when they get a, a more mature, they'll get these kind of patterny blotches on their face. The females get little teeny dots all over. And you see the dots on this one? This one could grow up to be one of the imitator species uh, puffers. This happens very frequently, and in most batches of over 100 that are wild-caught, you'll get some. So, very interesting, and the last thing that really gives it away is that there is an iridescent blue color that you'll see once, once they've fully adapted and gotten comfortable in their new habitat that you won't find on the imitator uh, species you'll find darker colors and more of kind of a beige or brown than that bright, bright yellow. So these fish were discovered originally uh, to the Western world, as it may be. Um, they were discovered by a man named Dr. Sunder Lahora. And he was a an Indian uh, ichthyologist and naturalist and he discovered a whole lot and cataloged a whole lot of species in India in his lifetime. 1941 is the year that these guys were uh, these guys were identified as a species of their own. And within another 10 years, uh, the imitator species was also identified. There are a total of four other uh, dwarf puffers in the region and then another one in Borneo and two in Malaysia, apparently, that are considered dwarf puffers by ichthyologists uh, that are all small. But this is by far, these two are the smallest species, definitely. And they're very active, they're very personable, they make a great pet if you want something that they learn their owners, they know when you're coming in to feed them, and uh, they have a pretty quick metabolism, as you can see, they move around a lot. They like warmer water, and yes, they can be a bit nippy, so if you've never kept these before, you probably want to keep them in at least a 10-gallon like this, if not a 20-gallon. Um, they're a great fish for a hexagonal tank that's a 20 or 15, 20, 30, whatever uh, tank, or even a smaller uh, bow front. If you did a species only, you know, you could do 5 to 12 of them, and as far as water parameters go, they're going to want water parameters that are similar to the water of Kerala, India, and the mountain streams, rivers, and lakes that they live in. So what does that water look like? Well, for the most part, most of the year, it's, it's been runoff from the monsoon, the wet season that happens half of the year, essentially, or a little less. But they live in the calmer parts of rivers and lakes, so this would be too much flow for them, probably. It's better to do something like a sponge filter, or if you're doing a hang off the back, just put some um, batting or turn it down if it has that functionality, but let it trickle more um, rather than just blasting them with current because they hang out in the slow areas and the other thing is they don't like open water as a species they tend to like dense vegetation so 
while we haven't set this tank up yet, this is kind of the quarantine tank for them, this is more to their, their, their style, to their liking. Um, if you really want to imitate what their rivers look like, it would be something like this, where you've got an open margin with faster water, and then a very slow area with plants. You want some finer plants, maybe some Rotala indica or some uh, Hygrophila pinnatifata, Java moss, Java ferns, things like that. And then hardscape is very important, as well as stiffer leaf plants. And also floating plants are great too, because uh, the males, one really fun thing that they do is at night, the alpha male will generally try to sleep high in the water. And so he will try to sleep, like in this tank, he would probably pick up here. And he will sit on that little branch or maybe up in here. And he will look out on all the other males to make sure no one's going to challenge him. And all the other females to make sure they're safe, essentially. Now, these are egg scattering fish also. But they actually do protect their babies. The males will protect their babies for a while uh, until they're free swimming. The males guard the nest. So they're very territorial in that sense and it makes them a really interesting fish in that they are just kind of fun to watch and they, their eyes articulate each eye on its own moves around and can focus which is great uh, evolution but it's also great uh, fun to watch, you know, they really uh, will figure things out. However, they do have a very smart little mind. They're micro predators that mostly eat meat and little crustaceans, shrimp, uh, snails, and things like that in the wild. So you're going to want to make sure that, one, they're not bored in their tank, and two, that you have either uh, live food like baby brine shrimp or blood worms, black worms, um, even baby shrimp, honestly. Uh, I have lots of Malawa shrimp, uh, which are also an Indian shrimp, and uh, those and Babalti uh, shrimp, you can feed them. Uh, well, their Malawa shrimp are found all the way down through the Malay Peninsula as well, uh, and specifically this variety is found in Lake Sulawesi. But that's another story. I don't want to confuse you guys. But in any case, they eat those uh, those small dwarf shrimp and so you don't want to keep them with your cherry shrimp or anything else like that also it's good to feed them twice a day or to leave them some live food in in captivity they will use their beak which all puffer fish have a beak which is two teeth kind of fused together into a chisel they'll use that to crack open shells and to crack open um, snails so what they really love are ram's horn snails so let me show you some of those. And you can grow those easily in the same tank, but they may hunt them all down or separate tanks. So I grow them in with my guppies because they need a little bit harder water. Uh, you can see in here we've got crushed coral so that the snails can grow. But I've been growing out some snails so I'll have something to feed them. They don't particularly like Malaysian trumpet snails or assassin snails as much but they will happily go for pond snails, bladder snails, and ram's horn snails, like the ones you're seeing here. Uh, they'll crack them open and then they'll pull the meat out with their teeth, like little hands almost. So it's a really fascinating process to watch, if not a bit brutal. The thing is, you have to watch their water quality because these fish, like I was saying, they live in areas that are getting runoff that has been it, it rains feet and feet and feet of rain in a few month period and then it makes its way through the soil and the stone in the region of Kerala and the Ghats, western Ghats Mountains and so that causes the water to have a fairly low TDS and a fairly neutral pH. By the end of the dry season you can sometimes get fairly acidic water because of leaves that have broken down in the streams and lakes that have just blown into the water and then also the water's been evaporating so the TDS rises as that happens. And as the TDS is rising, the temperature will also rise. And so their favorite temperatures around 78 degrees Fahrenheit uh, but they can definitely withstand all the way up to in the low 90s 
uh, because they hang out in kind of shallow water with these plants that are nearby. Usually a foot of water to two feet of water, um, half a meter of water or so, is about as, as deep as they like to go. They don't like those open waters because they are teeny and they're little snacks and they're bright. But another really fun thing about them is just their, the amount that they move around. And I've, I've told you a little bit about some of their activity and how they can switch genders when they're young and how that can keep changing if you have a colony. It's not a boring fish to have one species of a fish that can do that kind of stuff. But if you want to breed them, they do have interesting behavior. And like I said, the males will post out a little territory and they will sometimes nip at each other. And usually if it's other pea puffers, it's okay. They kind of, uh, they usually won't kill each other. Sometimes you get a bloodthirsty one that will, but they will usually just kind of post out a little spot and declare about six inches from that spot theirs and essentially chase or false charge any other fish that come in there other than females that are interested in reproducing. Well, what makes them reproduce? Well, feeding them live food for one and having live food that's teeny so they know that there's food for their babies. I mean, they're smart. Fish wait until they know that there is very fine food, very teeny live food, high in protein, because that's good for their babies. They also eat algae, and then they you have to remember that they're such meat eaters, but they're eating snails and they're eating shrimp and other things that eat algae, that eat detritus, that eat plants, and so by default they're swallowing all that as well. So really you don't want their diet to be more than 50 or 60% protein if you can help it. And if they're eating snails and they're eating bloodworms and maybe an algae wafer every three or four days, um, kind of switching it up, and they'll also forage for micro uh, fauna and flora in the tanks. If you have an older tank, they will easily just scavenge for what's around while they're bored in between feedings. Uh, and they can see very well with those eyes, very small too, and UV light it appears. Um, but that makes it so that they have a balanced diet. If you just give them blood worms all day every day or just snails all day every day, it can be a problem. And also, when you scoop them up in a net, ideally you wanna keep the net wet or get a special net. Like Aquatic Arts sells these for shrimp, but they work well for pea puffers too, where the bottom is vinyl and the top is a grate uh, so the water can be strained out but then you've still got enough water because if these puffers expand, they have a hard time retracting. Puffers only do that in extreme situations. And these guys are already pretty rotund and round looking as is. The females will get even more round and they'll get a belly that's kind of swollen and usually more speckles on them where the males will get more bright iridescence behind their eyes and they'll get really bright yellow and sometimes a lime green or kind of an off green, uh, light green on them in their body. And then uh, in that territory that they've established, if you trigger the water to be warm, uh, that gets them ready and the live food gets them ready. But then what really helps is a water change and a lowering, or, or sorry, so you, you've let the water evaporate over time, you've given them live food, and you do this for a couple weeks, but then all of a sudden, you top the tank back off, maybe you add a few inches of water back to the tank, and you drop the temperature about five degrees total, however much that requires, and they will think that it's raining. They will think that that is the wet season. And as long as there's food, then they will make a nest and they do this so that their babies can hatch and then expand by the time that the rains have come and flooded regions and they can expand their territory to new spots that maybe they couldn't reach previously. So pretty amazing. We're going to feed them and I'm going to tell you a little more trivia, but that's really the basics of caring for them. They will lay eggs. The male will then protect where the female laid and uh, raise them until they are uh, no longer little sticky headed wrigglers and we'll wait till their yolk sac's gone and then once they're free swimming they're kind of on their own so you can take dad out because if he gets hungry enough he's gonna munch on the babies like most fish will. 
Now, we'll talk about what they pair with and things when we feed them in a moment and as I get them acclimated. But I just wanted to uh, do the overall kind of introduction to the species, a very comprehensive one. So if you like that, please hit that like button. And uh, if you want to see more of this, always uh, come back, check out what's going on, click the bell, and make sure it's selected so that you're getting all updates if that's what you want. Uh, sometimes it gets unselected, and I know how that goes. So let's feed them. If, not, if you're not sticking around for that, then I hope you have a great evening, and I will talk to you later. All right, so we've got some parting notes here, and first off is what they like to eat. And I mentioned this earlier, but they love bloodworms, Ram's horn snails, bladder snails, we've got a selection of color and size, and then we've got some frozen blood worms in here. I'm very allergic to blood worms, so I can't handle them. I have to use a, a, a little uh, turkey baster. And then we've also got some other Daphnia and carnivore pellets in here. They've been hanging out for a few hours now on their own, and what they managed to do was hunt the shrimp in here immediately so they may not go for this food plus it's really late at night so we'll see what happens but I wanted to at least give it a go right and see what happens right now they're pretty interested in their own reflection from what I can tell but let's give it a go let's give them some blood worms first get the blood in the water so to speak we might actually get the cichlids that are in here too who have been so shy they don't come out for anyone I'd be amazed if they came out to check it out but yeah bloodworm in and like i said this is a special treat for them just like with bettas you don't want to feed them bloodworms every day and the other thing with puffers oh we did we are going to see the cichlids so curious if we'll see the other this is right now my quarantine tank and so the cichlids are in here but yes the puffers are also here so we're gonna get them both they're both eating we got them both munching down no problem so that's good they're not gonna have any trouble eating joining us in here you saw how quickly he gulfed that down I don't even know what that is that they're eating but they're eating something they can get a little aggressive at mealtime but if you stuck around this long I'm gonna give you some deeper dive trivia on the puffers so these little puffers uh, are actually part of a story in ichthyology, in the history of fish, that is uh, something that is now kind of common sense, but at the time it was actually a big deal. And uh, what that story is, let's see, ooh, does he see the snail? Does he want the snail or does he want, oh, he wants, he wants the blood worms, of course. Why wouldn't you want the bloodworm? You can see they'll fight over them. So, uh, and that looks like a male and a female if I had to guess, or it could be from another species. So when we're talking about pairing off real quick with other species, you can either have species that are big enough to hold their own against the puffer fish, and I mean way big enough, like cribs or um, peacock gudgeons or something like this that won't attack them though either if these guys were mean fish they could attack and actually kill the, the pea puffers very quickly so the pea puffers won't stand down for the most part no matter how big their nemesis is uh, so you want to make sure that the big fish that are in there with them are not going to eat them or if you use smaller fish, even though I said that they should be in a species tank, if you've kept them before or if you're really adventurous, I've kept them with many other fish over the years, but I've had to keep them with things like peacock gudgeons, bettas, um, a little more aggressive things. Not so aggressive like an Oscar or something that it would actually just try to eat the puffers themselves, but enough that if the puffer bites it, it's going to chase the puffer it's going to, uh, you know, flare up and give some attitude. So it's, it's not going to stand down. And these guys are kind of a good match right now. These, uh, these are gold ring or gold eye, um, golden dwarf cichlids, whatever you want to call them. But we'll see here. Looks like he doesn't want to go after the snails. That's actually a trait that they kind of learn 
to get better at over time. But for a while, and if you look at my old videos, I had some puffers that would eat with bettas and with other um, peacock gudgeons and a few other fish, some guppies in there too, and they would hunt together. And actually the, uh, the, the gudgeons would go get the snail, the pea puffer would crack the snail shell, and then the goby or betta would kind of steal the insides, uh, the organ meat that the or the uh, muscle meat, the foot meat that these guys don't always eat. But like I was saying earlier, these guys are messy eaters in that they will also kill things. Um, you know, bloodworms can be messy too. Uh, they'll suck out the the red part of the bloodworms, the the bloody in, intern in internals, and uh, then they'll just uh, peace out with the empty bodies of the the worms there sometimes if if they've been frozen and kind of expanded and turned into goo. So you want fresh bloodworms if possible or flash frozen. See how this one has some clear on it? They'll leave that clear sometimes. So since they're so messy, it's good to go in with a, a uh, pipette or something and clean up uh, or gravel vac just above the surface so that ammonia doesn't build up because they are very, very sensitive little creatures. They have sensitive little feelings when it comes to ammonia. They will not put up with pretty much any. So. The last story I was going to tell you on this long, drawn-out video is that Dr. Sunder Lahora uh, was an Indian doctor in what's now modern-day Pakistan, but he became a senior fellow in London at the um, Royal Institute of Ichthyology, Zoology, Marine Biology, uh, and he came up with this idea that the Western Ghat Mountains and the Malay uh, slash Indo, or basically the Indian continental plate, that they were two separate areas and that the watersheds drained just like a continental divide. In, in the United States, the Rockies are the continental divide. But just like a continental divide, uh, he found that completely different fish lived in each watershed. Uh, for the most part. There's a few exceptions, but he found a theory of the divides that basically split up continents or even islands. So Papua New Guinea, for instance, or Indonesian islands, Sulawesi. There are ridges, and they don't run just down the middle or whatever. They run on the high point of an area, which makes sense because water's flowing from that point. And that's why there are two so similar puffers. One is on one side of the mountains and one is on the other. And then they meet kind of in the middle in a lake that drains into that basin. And so the hypothesis is that you will get both a lot of convergent and divergent evolution just because there are more options for it to happen. So just because there is the abundance of flora and fauna doubled when you have a continental divide and they get to the continental divide and then they split up or mountains rise over millions of years or uh, an ice age happens, whatever it may be that, that solidifies the change. He is the professor and uh, the ecologist that came up with that idea that they would be different and that they would drift but that you'd also get some that were very similar. And he proposed that there was a secondary species, the one that emulates this one and that is often mixed in in the hobby, he proposed that there would be a very, very similar puffer as to this because the fossil record of a common ancestor went really far back for these small puffer varieties. And... Uh, he proposed that. He didn't go out in the field as he got older, but someone else brought them back. So I thought that was pretty cool, and um, it seems like common sense now that, of course, where the waters divide and go different ways, you get different fish. And some are going to develop the same adaptations, even though they're completely different timelines, and others are going to diverge and look really radically different. 
And uh, the last thing I'll, I'll let you guys know here is that the, the pea puffers, they will eat and eat until their bellies are very swollen. So try not to overfeed them a ton. And uh, they can handle quite a bit of food, but, but don't overfeed them uh, a ton. Try to, you know, if, if they're still eating after 10 or 15 minutes, definitely cut them off. Really, it should be all they can eat in about three to five minutes. But when you have multiple fish coming in and kind of uh, sharing the meal, and when you put a limited quantity, as I have in here for five of them, plus those cichlids, um, you will learn what is, you know, a fair or a decent amount of time for them. But that is the pea puffer and its evil twin. Well, not so evil, but its twin. Uh, and I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I know it was a long one, but that's what my channel is uh, definitely based upon, is bringing you guys most interesting stories and info that I can, and uh, not cutting off the bunny trails and, and interesting side stories that we may come across while learning about these incredible creatures in the secret history living in our aquariums.